Yeah, 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 we see them. Fantastic. Okay, cool. Uh, welcome back, everyone. So next, we have Li Yang Tan from Stanford University, who is going to tell us about testing and reconstruction via decision trees. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Very happy to see so many friendly names in the audience. Um, I'm going to talk about joint work with Guy Blank and Jane Lang, students at Stanford and MIT. Uh, two things. One is the slides and also the paper. Uh, they, they are available on my web page. So if you prefer to you know, scroll, scroll around as I speak, uh, you can go to my web page. And the second thing is, uh, please interrupt me with questions. That will make it a lot more fun for me. I did a practice run yesterday and I, I went five minutes over time. So I, I, I think we have a 45 minute slot. I cut out a section and now we are at 40 minutes. So I'm five minutes under time. Uh, so I think we should be able to go at a very relaxed pace. Okay, yeah, please ask questions. Okay, good. Um, so let's get started. So this is about testing and reconstruction. These are two tasks that are closely related to learning. So let me, I thought I'll start by talking about decision tree learning. Uh, this is a very well studied and basic problem uh, given labeled data, uh, x, y pairs. And our goal is to, to generate a decision tree that represents this data. Or as we like to think about it in learning theory, uh, the function that labels the data. So this is an extremely basic and well-studied algorithmic task. Okay, uh, and decision trees are going, going to be the star of this talk. So I'll spend one more slide on uh, just talking about them. Uh, they're one of the most popular models in machine learning and their popularity really stems from their simplicity. Uh, they, you know, they have this really simple, easy to understand structure. They are fast to evaluate to figure out how a decision tree labels an input, we simply follow the relevant path uh, down the tree. And the number of variables we have to look at uh, is the length of the path. And this is often much smaller than, than the dimension of the problem. As I mentioned, they have this like flowchart-like structure. They're easy to un understand. And relatedly, they're also very, it's also very easy to explain the predictions of a decision tree model. Why do you label this input zero? Well, x7 was one x11 was zero and x2 was one. That's why I labeled it zero. Uh, decision trees are really one of the canonical uh, examples of an interpretable function class. Algorithms for, for learning decision trees from labeled data, they're some of the most classic algorithms in, in machine learning and they continue to be widely employed and they perform very well in practice. Okay, so that's decision trees and decision tree learning. This talk is not directly about decision trees learning, it's about testing and reconstructing decision trees. These are two tasks, uh, both of which are easier than learning, or to be formal, they are no harder than learning. Uh, as we'll see in this talk, well, we're gonna focus on, on decision trees and we'll draw on recent techniques from learning decision trees to test and reconstruct them. And our results uh, for testing and reconstruction, they have new implications for learning theory, uh, for learning decision trees. Uh, so, in fact, one of the things I hope to convince you of in this talk is that although testing, reconstruction, and learning, these are three algorithmic tasks they can study for any function class. In this talk, we're going to focus on decision trees. This web of connections among these three basic tasks, they're surprisingly rich. Uh, many of these implications and connections, they're not known for other function classes. And in this talk, we'll, we'll establish them by leveraging the specific structure uh, of decision trees. And hopefully in just in the next few slides, when I start to describe my results, our results, uh, we'll see some of these surprising connections come in. Okay, so let's get started. I, this is a testing and learning workshop. So I think a lot of us, all of us know what testing is. Um, let me start with reconstruction. I myself, I wasn't too familiar with this notion before I started working on this project. I like to think of reconstruction as on the fly learning. So let me try to explain that point of view. So we are given query access to an unknown function f, just like learning. And we're promised to, that f is close to a small decision tree, just like learning. Uh, so this is a picture we have, in, we have in mind. And in traditional learning, and in this talk when I say learning, I always mean proper learning. In the case of decision trees, I like to output a decision tree hypothesis. In traditional learning, we like to construct a decision tree hypothesis, call it t, right? And we like t to be of size not so much larger than s, and we like t to still be somewhat close to f, maybe around opt or opt plus epsilon. So that's traditional proper learning. What is on-the-fly learning? Well, it's very simple. 
you do not have to compute construct T, but you just have to support queries to T. So if someone else comes along and they, they give us X, we should be able to respond with T of X uh, to them. They come with X prime, we respond with T of X prime and always consistently with a specific decision tree hypothesis T. Um, right away, we see that reconstruction is no harder than learning. If we constructed the entire decision tree hypothesis T, we can certainly support queries to T. Uh, the name of the game here is to do things faster and more query efficiently uh, than constructing the entire decision tree hypothesis. And so can you support queries to your hypothesis without actually constructing the hypothesis? Okay, so that's reconstruction. And with that, I can state our main result, which is a new reconstruction algorithm for decision trees. So here's our result. We are given query access to an unknown function f. It's promised to be up close to a size s decision tree. So we're also given s as a parameter, so we know what s is. So is this is a picture that we have in our minds. We support queries to a decision tree hypothesis t of size s to the quasi polynomial on s, not too much larger than s. And t itself is still somewhat close to f. It's at most order of plus epsilon close to f. We do not construct this t. Uh, that would be learning. However, we are able to support queries to t uh, where every query is answered efficiently. So if someone else comes, with, comes to us with x, we can respond with t of x, x prime, t of x prime, so and so forth. And every x that comes to us, we have to interact with f uh, with poly log s log n many queries. And to ask f a single query that requires sort of like preparing an n bit string. So we incur an overhead of necessary overhead of n in our runtime. So our runtime is simply poly log s times n log n. So that's our main result. Uh, any questions? So this is what we get for on the fly learning. So certainly this is only interesting if it's better than not on the fly learning. So let me compare this with what is known or what's possible for learning itself, traditional learning. So we have our result on the right where we can respond without constructing T, we can respond to queries uh, quite efficiently, poly log S times log N many queries. Uh, what is known for learning? Well, information theoretically, um, even for non-proper learning and even for the realizable setting where opt is zero, so this much simpler than, than the setting depicted on the left, uh, it's not too hard to see that you need omega as many queries. And again, since to make a single query, you need to prepare an n bit string and send it to f, you need omega s times n time. So here comparing you know, our result on the right and this easy fact on the left, we see that we're getting an exponential improvement over the information theoretic minimum required to learn. So this is one of the advantages of on-the-fly learning. We do not construct T. However, we are able to support queries to T uh, with query and time efficiency that is quite a bit more efficient than what is possible for learning. And, and just a clarification uh, question. So the size of the tree uh, that is consistent with all the answers is s to the one over epsilon squared. That's what you said, right? Oh, s to the log s. I, I wish it was s to the one over epsilon squared. It's quasi polynomial in s, even for fixed epsilon, it's s to the log s squared. Uh -huh. Yeah. And yeah. so, OK. Yeah, so there's room for improvement, although I'll talk more about it. Um, even for just, yeah, the, it'll be nice to bring the size down. It'll also be nice to bring this order of plus epsilon down to one times of plus epsilon. And I guess in the number of queries, do you also have a one over epsilon squared then? Uh, thank you. Yes, I'm hiding the dependence. Thank you. I'm hiding the dependence on epsilon in the query and time complexity. It's poly one over epsilon everywhere. And I imagine for learning, it's a little bit different, the dependency on epsilon. No, I think. Or it's one over epsilon squared for the number of queries also? Yeah. OK, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so how do you measure distance? Uh, you know, what is op test? In what metric uh, do you compute uh, distance? Uniform distribution, I should have mentioned this, uniform distribution throughout the talk. And I'll mm -hmm. this only apply to the uniform distribution. All right, thanks.
yeah, it'd be very interesting. Um, I think you know it, everything will go through for product product distributions, but but certainly not for non-product. Well, we don't have any results for non-product distributions, and I'll find it very interesting to get something for for, for general distributions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please ask more questions. Okay, uh, good. So that's our result for reconstruction. And as a consequence, we get a new tester for decision trees. Our reconstruction algorithm, to our knowledge, is the first reconstruction algorithm for decision trees. And from it, we get a new tester, but testing decision trees has been extremely well studied. So I'm going to state our result and I'm going to compare it with, with, with what's known for testing decision trees. So it's, here's the setup. We're given query access to an unknown function f. This is parameter s. We talk to f for a bit. And we output yes if f is epsilon close to a size s decision tree. And then we output no if f is epsilon far or only epsilon far from a quasi polynomial size decision tree. It's the same quasi polynomial size as the one we saw in the previous slide. Okay, so you know, this, uh, as we all know, testing allows us to get a ballpark sense as to, to how big you know, the decision tree for f is. And you know, the same kind of query and time complexity comes up. We can do this in poly log s times log n queries. And again, just to ask a, a single query, we need a factor of n. So the overhead and runtime is poly log s times n log n. Okay, so that's our tester. Um, and again, everything with respect to the uniform distribution. So as I mentioned, our reconstruction algorithm as far as we know, it's the first, but this testing is certain, we're not, certainly not giving the first tester for decision trees. It's, it has been very well studied in, in testing decision trees, and I'll work as, as to a long line of work on testing decision trees. So in the next slide, I'd like to compare uh, our new tester with what's known. Uh, the long story short is that it's incomparable, but I'd like to spend a slide telling you how it's incomparable. So here's our tester in pictures on the top. So here are the existing testers, uh, the, the sort of the one that achieved the, achieved the best parameters dealing on, on a line of work uh, was given by Pashuri just this year. So let's not worry about the query and time complexity of this tester yet, we'll come to that. But even just the setup of the problem is different. Um, these testers, they say yes, if F is exactly a size S decision tree, and they say no, if F is epsilon far from a size S decision tree. So sort of our exit condition is more stringent. We have to say yes, as long as F is epsilon close to a size S decision tree, whereas they only have to say yes if F is exactly a size S decision tree. So that makes our job more challenging. On the other hand, just to balance that out, their reject condition is more stringent. They have to say no, as long as F is epsilon far from size S decision trees, whereas we only have to say no, if f is epsilon far from a quasi polynomial size decision tree. So, uh, so they're incomparable. And in the language of property testing, uh, we, we get a tolerant tester, which is more challenging, whereas they deal with sort of like the single criteria testing, which is more challenging, whereas we do this, you know, by criteria on, you know, parameter choice testing. So there's just a setup itself is incomparable. So let's compare our query complexity and time complexity. Uh, there we look, uh, we, we, we compare quite favorably. The Bashuri's tester requires linear or slightly superlinear, in fact, in as many queries. And again, just make a quote. Uh, and their runtime is actually quite a bit worse than S times N. Uh, their runtime is S to the S times N, so exponential in S. So our Query complexity and runtime compared quite favorably with, with this existing testers. We, we, we are getting an exponential improvement in query complexity from S versus poly log S. And runtime, we are even getting a doubly exponential improvement in the dependence on S. Okay. So that's, uh, that's how our tester compares with the existing testers. You could still ask, uh, as we did, looking at the right-hand side of this picture, well, what if, could we improve our tester to like being retaining tolerance and making it single criteria, right? That will make our result, our, our setup strictly more challenging than that of the existing testers. So can we strengthen our tester 
so that we do not deal in this you know, parameterized setting and strengthen this to, to reject as long as f is epsilon far from size s. So again, if we are able to do this, that'll be quite satisfying. That will make our tester, our, our setup strictly more challenging, quite a bit more challenging than, than uh, existing testers. So that brings me to our final result. We do not give such a tester, but we come full circle uh, and connect it back to learning. So we show that if we are able to do such an improvement, then we get quite a new striking result in learning. We get a fully polynomial time algorithm for proper learning of decision trees. This is uh, quite a well-known open problem, and this will be quite the breakthrough. So the statement again is suppose we can get a tester that is tolerant and in this single criteria S versus S setting, but quite a, set, a standard you know, question. If we're able to get such a tester, then we get a fully polynomial time algorithm for proper learning of size S decision trees. And the, the runtime of the, the, the current best algorithm for, for proper learning of decision trees, it's a classic result of Aaron Foy and House, where it runs in quasi polynomial time. So any improvement on it will be exciting. Certainly bringing it down to fully polynomial time will be extremely exciting. Uh, some even think it's impossible. Okay, and... Leon, quick question. Yes. The learning algorithm here would be with membership queries or? Your author? Yes, it would be with membership queries. Whereas the also is without membership queries. But it would still be a breakthrough because of being proper. Absolutely, yeah. Right. Okay, thanks. So everything is proper. Yeah, thanks. So as Rocco mentioned, if we are interested in non-proper learning, then we do have such a, such a fully polynomial time algorithm, thanks to Kush, Lepitz, and Mansour. Yeah, thanks, Rocco. Yeah, in this talk, I just mean, I always mean proper learning. I like to output the decision tree. Okay, uh, and just one, you know, sort of uh, non-technical note, I guess. Uh, the direction, you know, the fact that if you have a proper learning algorithm, you get a testing algorithm. This is standard and not too hard to see. Uh, so this is also the fact that testing itself is no harder than proper learning. This box, our result gives an example of the converse uh, that a testing algorithm gives a proper learning algorithm for the same class. So, um, which I find quite interesting. I'm not aware of having asked Rocco also about this. I, I don't, I'm not aware of previous examples of such an implication, uh, although I'll, I'll love it if someone could correct me. Um, but anyway, uh, for, for decision trees, we now have such a connection that if you have know, a good enough tester, you actually can learn. Okay, so that actually, that's all of our main results. But I would like to tell you about some consequences of our results, not for decision trees. So decision trees are a basic object, not just in learning and machine learning, but you know, they, 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 they also hold a special place in the hearts of complexity theorists. They, one reason is decision tree complexity is closely related quantitatively to many other measures of human function complexity. Uh, the Fourier degree, approximate degree, randomized Fourier complexity, sensitivity, so on and so forth. Uh, the study of these quantitative relationships is, is, the, is a field of Fourier complexity, very active, many exciting developments recently. And thanks to these relationships, uh, our results for decision trees immediately give us new reconstructors and new testers for all these properties. And the, the sort of the landscape is the same for, for these properties. We give the first reconstructors for these properties, uh, and they in turn yield testers. But test in terms of testing, you know, for many of these properties, uh, testing for these properties has been ex extremely well studied. So good. Uh, I was thinking I would just uh, list one of such one such consequence for Fourier degree, giving a reconstructor for Fourier degree. So. Here's what we have. So first of all, this fact from Fourier complexity, this is not due to us, this is, this is you know, well known. So for every Boolean function f, um, the Fourier degree, the degree of f as a polynomial of the reals is no larger than its decision tree depth. That's easy to see. What is surprising and cool is the fact that the decision tree depth is also upper bounded by a polynomial, of, uh, polynomial factor of the Fourier degree. So using this fact that you know, decision tree depth is sandwiched by degree, we can combine it with our decision tree reconstructor and get a reconstructor for, for a degree, or low degree polynomials. 
So here's a statement. I think maybe you can all guess what it's going to say. Well, given query access to an unknown function f, it's promised to be close to a low degree Boolean function. We support queries to a polynomial q of degree not too much larger than that of p, b to the seventh, that is still close to f and most order of plus epsilon. And every query to q is answered efficiently. If you come to me with x, I can respond q of x without constructing x itself, uh, without constructing q itself. And every query I can respond by only making poly d times log n mini queries to f. And you know, one time with a factor of n over n. So that's our reconstructor for the Fourier degree. It follows as an immediate consequence of, of our decision tree reconstructor. And to me, this is really a testament to the magic of Fourier complexity. Right, looking at this, this result, I wouldn't have thought to go through decision trees. It's, you know, it seems like there's more of an analytics feel to it. Uh, but thanks to this fact right, at the top of this page, uh, that's really, it's really in some sense equivalent uh, to constructing decision trees. Okay, um, so here's the outline for the rest of this talk. I, was, I really want to tell you about the key structural result that analyzes the, the algorithmic consequences that I just talked about. And I'd like to show you most of its proof. The next bullet is what I cut out. Uh, I, I was gonna tell you about how our reconstruction algorithm follows as a consequence of this structural result. I don't have time for that, um, but the slides are on my webpage. So I was thinking I'll skip this next bullet and I'll, I'll close the talk by talking about some further avenues for future work. Um, yeah, the structural result is, this, this works out well. The structural result is what I'm most excited about. And I think there could be applications beyond just learning and testing and reconstruction. So I'd like to tell you about uh, this, this structural result and its proof. Okay. Leon, if you're, quick question. If, yes. um, if you're looking at real value decision trees and your loss is square loss, do your yeah. results also hold for that setting? Thanks, Adam. You mean the output or the input? The outputs are real valued. Yeah, I suspect our we do not we do not write this in the paper. I suspect our results also go through for, for real valued and for for bear, uh, sort of like square loss. Yeah, but I yeah um, maybe let's yeah maybe I can follow up on this. I'm pretty sure it does. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so here's the key structural result um, in a nutshell. Uh, this is not going to be formal, but it, the spirit of it is as follows. Suppose you tell me f is close to a small decision tree. f is up close to a size s decision tree. Okay, here's the picture I have in mind. Well, but, you know, I really have no idea what this tree looks like. Why should I? You know, there could be multiple such trees, first of all. I have no idea what the internal nodes look like. I have no idea what its leaves look like, right? However, our structural result says that f is o plus epsilon, or order of plus epsilon, close to a tree t, um, the purple tree, of size quite a bit bigger than s, quasi polynomial s. So it's quite, uh, slightly bigger, and its distance f has grown a little bit, uh, which is not ideal, neither of which is ideal. But in exchange for that, uh, this tree in purple has a very specific structure and has many enjoyable properties. I can describe exactly to you what each of its internal nodes are, I can tell you exactly what its leaves are. And we'll make that formal in a, in a second. And our algorithms for reconstruction and testing will leverage the structure and these properties. Okay, so the, the bulk of the talk will be devoted to telling you about this purple tree. Okay, so let me just tell you about all the properties and structure of this tree. The two of which we have already seen, one is that it's op plus epsilon or order op plus epsilon close to f. The second is that the size is s to the log s squared. Well, th those are, I guess, the properties of the tree. Now I have to tell you, I have to fill in this like blank triangle. I have to tell you about the structure of this tree. For every internal node of the tree, let's call the path that leads to the internal node pi, I can tell you exactly what the variable query at this internal node is. It's gonna be xi, where xi is the variable with the largest noisy influence on the subfunction f sub pi. So the next few slides, I'll tell you what I mean by noisy influence. 
But now let me just mention that there's some measure of the importance of a variable. So that's going to be my notion of importance. And at every node, I'm going to query the variable that I find the most important. Here is denoted x on. And for the leaves, uh, we do the most natural thing possible. Um, for every leaf L, I will label L with the, the zero one bit that corresponds to the bias of F sub L, the sub function. If it's more biased towards one, I plumb down the one leaf. If it's more biased towards zero, I plumb down the zero leaf, the most natural thing possible. So really it's sort of like the, 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 the smarts come in in three, deciding what to split on. And that's gonna be the, the focus of the next few slides. Okay, so what's this notion of noisy influence? Uh, as I mentioned, it assigns to every variable a number that denotes how important it is. And I'm gonna split on the, the, the variable that is most important according to this measure. So to tell you about noisy influence, I have to first tell you about noise sensitivity. The noise sensitivity of a function, uh, F and noise rate delta is this probability. You draw X uniformly at random, and you draw a delta noisy copy y, and you tell me the probability that f of x differs from f of y. And a delta noisy copy is simply what you get by re-randomizing every coordinate with probability delta. Or equivalently, since we're working over the uniform distribution, by flipping every coordinate with probability delta over two. So, you know, I start at a uniform random point x in a hypercube. I take a little random walk. I like to know whether I walked, you know, from f of x equals one to f of x equals zero, or vice versa. So there's some measure of the complexity of the function, and that's noise sensitivity. What's the noisy influence of a variable? Noisy influence of a variable i on f is what the drop in noise sensitivity when x i is queried. That's how I like to think about it. Um, this is it in, in math. It's drop. In noise sensitivity when you know xi is good. The larger the drop, the higher the noisy influence. And to me, the higher the noisy influence, the more important I find this variable. So my tree is going to be built by at every node, I query the the variable that results in the largest drop in noise sensitivity, the variable of highest noisy influence. Okay, so that's sort of like, I guess you would call this a splitting criteria of my decision tree. Let me actually, this may seem like it came out of nowhere, why this notion of importance. Um, so I'd like to put it in context a little bit. So. This, this, the context of this is in the splitting criteria of just decision tree learning heuristics for building decision trees in this like top-down manner. And it really builds off of, it, of real world heuristics like ID3, CART, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. They split on not the, the variable XI not with the largest noisy influence, but the largest correlation with, with the, with the sub-function. And, Noisy influence came out of some work we did trying to understand these heuristics. And roughly speaking, noisy influence can be viewed as the high order, a higher order generalization of correlation. Unfortunately, I do not have time to elaborate on what this means, uh, but you know, there are so many experts in the audience. Uh, the, the correlation of a variable with a function is simply its linear Fourier coefficient since we're working over the uniform distribution. And noisy influence is just a notion of correlation that takes, in not, takes into account not just the linear Fourier coefficient, but you know the, the, the higher order Fourier coefficients as well. And this, this, this generalization is necessary for a structure theorem. It's not too hard to see that any such structure theorem is impossible. It's just straight up false for correlation. If you use correlation as a splitting criteria instead of noisy influence. So that's how we came up with this notion of noisy influence as the splitting criteria. It builds quite naturally off of what they use in the real world uh, to build decision trees. And all of this sort of comes up from some work we have been doing, trying to understand these real world heuristics and trying to give guarantees on it. We, we realized that some of the techniques we developed there uh, has have applications back in theory. So this, is, this, this project was born out of that. 
Okay, so that's sort of a aside about why we, we, we go with noisy influence as our splitting criteria. Uh, let's go back to our structural result. Here we state it. So let f be any function uh, is up close to some decision tree of size s. Consider the tree t of size s to the log s squared, defined as follows. For every path pi leading to an internal node, query the variable with the largest noisy influence on f sub pi. And for every leaf, simply plumb down the zero one value that's the most natural, just round f sub l uh, according to its expectation. And the claim is that if you build this tree, then it's gonna be for any f, it's gonna be order of plus epsilon close to f. Okay, so I think I'll spend my remaining time proving this structural result. Let's dive in. So here, well, I've not done anything here. Here's just, you know, F is up close to the size of the June tree. This decision tree is on our right. Um, and my claim is that the distance with respect to the uniform distribution from T to F is order of plus epsilon. So how are we gonna prove this? Well, we think of T as being built layer by layer by layer. So I define T1 to be the first layer of T, or just simply like the root node of T, T2, the first two layers, T3, the first three layers, so on and so forth. And then, you know, I get a T sub log S cubed, that will be T itself. All right, think of T as being grown this way, layer by layer. I'm gonna define a potential function that assigns a score, a value to every tree in this sequence. T1, I'm gonna assign it a score. T2, I'm gonna assign it a score and so on and so forth. That this score is between zero and one. And the strategy is quite natural. For every K, let's say, let's focus on this TK. I'm gonna have this proof, this K split. Either I'm already done, that TK itself is order of plus epsilon close to F. And you know, it's not too hard to argue that if that's true, then the subsequent T, TK plus one, TK plus two is gonna remain close to F. So I'm either already done, or if I'm not already done, then I get a nice drop in potential. The, the potential of the next tree, TK plus one, is gonna be smaller than the potential of the current tree by quite a bit, epsilon squared over log S cubed. So if I'm, if I'm able to, to prove this dichotomy, then, then the result follows. Since if my potential function is bounded between zero and one, and you know, I always drop by at least epsilon squared over log S cubed, then certainly you know, before depth log S cubed over epsilon squared, I must fall into case one. I can only fall into case two that many times before I have to fall into case one. Okay, so I, I would like to tell you about this potential function and you know, tell you about this proof. Okay, the potential function is, it assigns, it takes in a tree and it outputs either zero or one. And in words, there's a noise sensitivity of F with respect to this tree T. So we have seen the definition of noise sensitivity of F. Uh, what does it mean to take the noise sensitivity of F with respect to a tree T? Well, it's quite natural. It simply means to take the noise sensitivity of the subfunctions defined by T. So I take the expectation over all leaves of T of the noise sensitivity of the subfunction of F at that leaf. And let's to get sort of comfortable with this definition, let me make two super basic observations. One is that phi of the empty tree as simply the noise sensitivity of F itself. And there's a number between zero and one because it's you know, the probability that f of x differs from f of y, where y is a noisy copy of x. So that's uh, observation one. And observation two is since I'm taking an expectation of something non-zero, uh, well, uh, something non-negative, uh, the phi of any tree t is at least zero for all trees t. So here I've, I've, we, have, we have convinced ourselves that phi is indeed uh, the output is bounded between zero and one. Okay, so now let's get to uh, analyzing the drop in potential when I go from TK to TK plus one. My goal in this slide is to convince you that our potential function defined in the previous slide syncs up perfectly with our splitting criteria. 
uh, which is to split on the variable with the highest noise influence. So they're sort of designed to sync up perfectly with, with each other. So in this slide, I'd like to you know, formalize what I mean by that. Okay, and recall that TK plus one is obtained from TK by splitting every leaf of TK uh, according to the variable with the highest noisy influence on, on the relevant subfunction. So let's, okay, let's look at the drop in potential of TK versus TK plus one. The first equality is just by definition. The phi of TK is the noise sensitivity of F with respect to TK. And phi of TK plus one is the noise sensitivity of F with respect to TK plus one. And how do we relate these two quantities? Well, here I'm taking an expectation of F with respect to TK. So I take a random path down to a leaf and I report the noise sensitivity of F sub L. And so how do we compare this? Well, this path L has a, the same path of course occurs in TK plus one. Now, rather than you know, ending at the leaf, it ends at a variable XIL, which is a variable with the highest noisy influence on F sub L. So how do we relate noise sensitivity of F sub L with the noise sensitivity of these two subfunctions? These are the two subfunctions that contribute to this quantity. So if we can do this, we can relate this, then you know, we, we should be in good shape. Well, this is a definition of noisy influence. The noise sensitivity of F sub L, this is what occurs on the left-hand side, is equal to the noisy influence of the variable you query plus the average noise sensitivity of the two induced subfunctions. Right, noisy influence is defined to be the drop in noise sensitivity when you query this variable. So that's nice. So this, you know, with this, so this is just a bunch of equalities. We get that the drop in potential can be written in terms of noisy influences. You go through all the leaves of TK, and the drop in potential is exactly the noisy influence of the variable that's queried, you know, when you go to TK plus one. So, so I alluded to this, the goal of this slide is just to convince you that our splitting criterion syncs up perfectly with our potential function. In fact, our splitting criterion is designed to greedily drive down our potential function. We want to query the variable of highest noisy influence. Sebastian, am I running out of time? You just turned the video on. No, I just wanted to show to you that we're listening. Oh, thanks. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, good. Uh, just out of curiosity, how much time do I have? You have a little bit less than 10 minutes, like more, more six minutes, seven minutes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, good. So that's our potential. You know, uh, it syncs up perfectly with our splitting criteria. In fact, just like it's very much inspired by real world heuristics, which is to greedily drive down some sort of potential function. And here we're uh, greedily driving down noise sensitivity. Okay, and you know, this is sort of the end of the technical part of the talk. So how do we show that we drive down the potential? Well, thanks to the previous slide, it suffices to show that we drive, we, we, we are querying variables of large noise and influence, our notion of the importance. So this is a key lemma uh, that it, for this part of, for the structural result, it says the following, if F is up close to a small decision tree size S, then I can lower bound um, the noisy influence of the, the variable with the highest noisy influence. Uh, the max over all I of the noisy influence of I on F is at least variance of F tilde, which I'll define in a second, minus opt divided by log S squared. I'll walk, walk through how we apply this lemma in a second, uh, but for now, let me just annotate it a little bit. F tilde is a smoothened version of F. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, I do not have time to formally define what I mean by smoothen. But for, for the experts in the audience, this is you know, what you get by applying like, the noise operator to F, this Bonami Beckner noise operator to F. And I'm, everything is sort of high level and not super formal here. Here I'm hiding the dependence on noise rate in this inequality. Noisy influence actually hides, um, well, takes in a parameter delta, and which I, I have not denoted. And also this inequality here also has a dependence on this noise rate delta. And also, you know, actually the smoothing version of that actually depends on sort of like how much you're smoothing it out by, which is also delta. So this is informal. 
Um, but this is a general idea of, of this key lemma. We need to show that we, we always get a variable of large noisy influence. And hence, we are always sort of aggressively driving down the potential function. So let me address, uh, I, I'm gonna, I'd like to talk us through how we apply this lemma. And let, me, let me just understand something. So you're gonna apply the lemma to F pi. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and so S is also going down as you go down in the tree, like F pi is represented by a smaller, so. Uh, the, yeah. So that's a little subtle. Well, yeah, exactly. So that, um, first of all, things are tricky because F itself is close to the size S decision tree, but there's no guarantee that F pi is like also close to a small decision tree. Right. You have to do this in expectation, right? In expectation, that's true. So that's one tricky thing that comes up. Uh, but well, other than that, you know, it's it takes work, but you know, we apply this not only to F, but all the F pi's as we go along. And we have to track, you know, what's your opt. You don't, you know, in, on average, of the, all the ops is of S, so that's good. And you know, you have to, now you're not dealing with F tilde, you're dealing with F pi tilde, and that's all that stuff. But but the variance is also going down, the variance of F pi or F tilde pi. Uh, exactly. So I'll come to that. But so yeah. Okay. But roughly speaking, if the variance is too low, I'm already happy. Yeah, so that's this case, but uh, thanks. But, so I'll get to how we apply this lemma in the next bullet, but for now, let me quickly mention that it's a variant of the OS, I should have a footnote here, sorry. Yeah, this is a variant of the OSSS inequality from analysis of Boolean functions uh, named after the authors, which itself you can, it's also, you can think of it as a variant of the KKL. Um, so that's just one thing I want to mention. And we sort of uh, built quite heavily on the techniques to, to get this. So as the title of that paper suggests, um, every decision tree has an influential variable. Well, you can think of our lemma as saying that every decision tree has a variable of high noisy influence. So it's, so, you know, we built, built on the techniques in the paper to get this lemma. And so how do we apply this lemma? Well, uh, well, when is the right hand side? Well, we, we're happy when the right hand side is large because it gives us a lower bound on the noisy influence. Well, if the variance of F tilde is at least op plus epsilon, then the right hand side is at least epsilon over log S squared. So that makes me happy. Uh, what this lemma is not so useful if, if the variance of F tilde is at most op plus epsilon. Uh, this takes a little bit of argument because it's only a statement about F tilde. But you, you go from here to saying that F itself also has variance in most order opt plus epsilon, which from then you can then conclude that F is order F plus, opt plus epsilon close to a constant. Um, so that's sort of like the proof strategy. Uh, if, you know, F, if, I, if I'm dealing with an F pi such that the variance of the tilde version is small, then I'm sort of happy. Uh, if not, I get a good drop in potential. Well, in which case I'm also happy, but yeah. Good, uh, well, that's sort of the technical, as, uh, yeah, as I said, I, 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 uh, I would like to mostly skip the next, next part, but although let me actually just remind you what our reconstruction algorithm is and tell you about like one standalone challenge we had to overcome and the team, the, the sort of like uh, the way we overcome it, because I, I think that this, the way we overcome it may be of independent interest. So here's our reconstruction algorithm. Um, it's been a while. We are given query access to F. It's promised to be close to a small size decision tree. We support queries to a decision tree hypothesis T. We do not construct it in full, but we're able to sort of like answer queries to it on the fly. And we are able to answer every query quite efficiently, uh, quite a bit more efficiently than, than the information theoret theoretic minimum required to, to learn a good hypothesis. Okay, so that's our reconstruction algorithm. And it's, it's the, the way it follows from our, so the, the structural lemma that, that I just walked us through is, is a big component of it, but that itself doesn't quite give us the reconstruction algorithm. There's still one challenge that came up and I'd like to tell you about this standalone challenge. So I'm gonna skip a bunch of slides. Oops. So here's the, here's the standalone challenge. Well, perhaps not surprisingly, you like to find a variable with large noisy influence, right? It's, 
along the way. So here's a standalone task. Given query access to F, you know, you can interact with it, but using as few queries as possible, I'd like to report I such that exactly as we expect. Well, this I is such that it's the coordinate with the highest noisy influence in F. Right, so this came up in, in getting the reconstruction algorithm. And we like to do this with as few queries as possible. Well, one, one challenge that comes up is that F has n variables. And so the naive way to do this is to estimate all n noisy influences. It's not too hard to see that this can be done to, you know, you can estimate every noisy influence using queries efficiently. However, there are n variables. So if we estimated all n noisy influences and output it like the max, then this seems like it would, it would give us omega n query complexity. Whereas I promised you uh, log n query complexity. So here's a lemma that we had to prove. It's not too hard, but I, I find it independently interesting. We give a query efficient way of simultaneously estimating all n noisy influences. So we are given query access to f. We make one over tau squared times log n. So the, the key thing here is the log n dependence and tau is an accuracy parameter. And after this interaction with f, we report n things, eta one to eta n. And we get it with high probability, eta i is a tau accurate estimate of the noisy influence of i on n. Um, so with this, you know, this is the second key part to our reconstruction algorithm. The first part being our, re our structural result. And this, this lemma comes in as well. And I do not have time to tell you about the proof, but at the crux of the proof, this is like a, the lemma itself gives like a one over tau squared times log n query um, estimator. The crux of the proof is to come up with like a two query unbiased estimator for all n noisy influences. And with this two query thing, you just amplify and re inbound. Okay, so that's, the, I, I hope I still have a few minutes. I'd like to wrap up with some, some avenues for future work. Okay, so the first one is uh, are there any further applications of all structural result? Well, one thing is that, you know, the quantitatively it can be, it, it could be improved. You know, this, this, it'd be nice to figure out whether we can improve this. It would be nice to make this one times off. Uh, but beyond that, it would be nice to find applications of the structural result beyond what we've talked about in this, um, in this talk. So as I alluded to briefly, this, this was inspired by real world decision tree learning heuristics, this, this structural result. And in this talk, we, we have seen some applications in reconstruction and testing these, these uh, decision trees come up in other places as well. So I wonder if this structural result could be useful for, for, for other things. So that's one thing. The second thing um, is for understanding the relationship between learning and testing and reconstruction of decision trees. As I mentioned at the start of the talk, these are generic algorithmic tasks. You can ask it for any function class that you like. And indeed people have asked it for many function classes. But for the class of decision trees, the connections seem to be surprisingly rich. Uh, I only had the chance to touch on a few of these surprising implications. In particular, one thing I did not care to talk about, which, which I really like, is this fact that testing decision trees, in some sense, imply learning of decision trees. So, um, which is not known for many of these connections are not known, or maybe it's just false for other classes, but for decision trees, it seems like by leveraging the specific structure of decision trees, we get a very nice sort of like web of connections. There's much more to be understood uh, quantitative and qu quantitatively and qualitatively among these three tasks. All very basic and independently interesting, and it's, it's nice that they have this connection. And finally, let me just make a pitch for, for a question I, I really like, which is to understand these like practical decision tree learning heuristics. This is not related to, not directly related to, to the talk, but sort of these algorithms are used in practice that sort of really just picks a good variable and splits on it. Picks picks a good variable, splits on it, so on and so forth. Can we give rigorous guarantees on, on, the, on the quality of these algorithms? What are some of the limitations of these heuristics? Sort of the most important decision we make here is to decide what to split on. Basically, that's the only decision we make. You know, we really choose a good thing to split on and keep going. So is there like a theory of, of you know, this splitting criteria being better than this, so on and so forth? And finally, decision trees, you know, it's 
a lot of algorithms in the real world, they do not grow just in one decision tree, but they grow like a hundred and they take the majority vote or something like this, or they throw it into like a booster boosting algorithm. And these really work very well in practice, but um, given that we don't really understand how a single decision tree learning algorithm works, we don't really have a very good understanding of these random forest and boost the decision tree algorithms either. So as far as I know, there's not been too much theory work on in this line, uh, except uh, and uh, by now classic paper of Prince and Mansour, uh, which is a, theory, a very nice theory paper on these like top-down decision tree learning algorithms. I just thought I'll close with a quote from them, which says that it seems fair to say that despite the other successes, the model, models of computational learning theory have not yet provided a significant insight into the apparent empirical success of programs like C4.5 and CART. And these are exactly sort of the decision tree algorithms that back then was widely used in practice and today still continues to be widely used in practice. So that paper is very nice. It took a big step towards rectifying this lack of understanding of, of these, the, these uh, heuristics. But still, I, I believe that the statement is still quite true today. And you know, 30 years is a long time. We, we know, know a lot more about decision trees now than we did 30 years ago. So I think it's a good time to sort of look at this question again. I, I really like it. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thanks a lot, Li Ying. Um, so we are uh, very much out of time. <laughs> so right, okay. it's okay, we should, uh, we should now take a, a 10 minutes break uh, before the last talk uh, of the session. So we have a 10 minutes break and we'll start again at uh, 11.30 slash 11.32.